right, we're just a couple minutes uh, before the start of the meeting right now. Uh, hopefully you can see the slide that's up on the screen, the welcome slide. Um, we are kind of, um, we have a little uh, task at the bottom to get you familiarized with the Zoom format in case, uh, in case you're one of those people who hasn't uh, had to be on these online uh, virtual meetings all spring, summer, and the beginning of the fall. Um, so if you don't mind just typing your name into the chat box um, so that we can practice a little bit and so we can get a sense of everybody who's here, that would be awesome. I'm just gonna wait maybe another minute or so before I start. All right, well, it's about 6.30. Um, uh, hi, everyone. Welcome to Southwest Michigan Land Conservancy's 2020 virtual annual meeting. Uh, we're really grateful that you all joined us under these unusual circumstances. Of course, we'd rather be sharing this beautiful evening with all of you uh, in person, um, but in a continued effort to follow social distancing guidelines and regulations. And to keep everyone safe and healthy, we thought a virtual annual meeting would be the best approach this year. Uh, we're really excited to have Hillary, Mitch, and Bruce introduce you to our climate resiliency plan. And uh, we're honored to have Dr. Lars Brudvig from MSU here to present his research project, Reconnecting Fragmented Landscapes for Biodiversity. Um, so this is our first time trying a virtual meeting of this size. We've done some staff meetings and things like that, but uh, this is our first time trying anything like this, so hopefully you'll bear with us as we kind of uh, learn along with all of you how to manage this type of thing. So um, I mentioned it a little bit earlier right before the meeting started to help us get familiar with the platform. Uh, we just wanted to ask everybody um, at the bottom of the slide here um, that says to uh, type your name into the chat box. Um, just so you can practice a little bit. The chat box is going to be how we're going to be uh, kind of communicating with all of you tonight. Um, so type your name in and uh, then we can kind of see everybody who's on the call. Um, so the first thing I wanted to do, um, for those of you who've been on Zoom calls before, this is probably all second nature by now, um, but for anyone who hasn't participated in a Zoom call or uh, for, for whom these calls are relatively new, we just wanted to kind of cover some basic uh, instructions for the meeting. Um, so the first thing I'm going to do is um, launch a little poll that we have um, to ask folks um, how many people have participated in a Zoom call before. Um, and if so, um, if you have participated, how many? Um, so we can kind of get a sense of where everybody is at. Looks like lots of people have done more than Let's see, I'll share the results with you in just a second. Then almost 30 seconds, all right. So yeah, looks like most people have been in uh, well over 10 of these things. So hopefully that means you guys all know how to use this platform and, uh, and this will be smooth sailing. Um, so I uh, just wanted to um, let everybody know that this meeting is going to be recorded um, and um, uh, posted later to our website and our YouTube channel. And actually I, okay, record on this computer. I'm gonna hit the record button right now. Um, so uh, all of everybody's mics are muted right now. Um, we kind of did this um, to keep down on background noise for, um, for the call, uh, just to kind of keep things running smoothly. Um, so everybody's mics have been muted upon entry. Um, if you have any questions or comments along the way as we're going through uh, the meeting, if you could please type them in the chat box. Uh, that's the thing that you use to type your name in. So most, in most cases, it's sort of in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. Um, so uh, the uh, staff is going to be monitoring the chat box um, to see if they can answer any questions you might have. If there are questions that the speakers can't answer, um, we will uh, gather those questions and present them to the speakers at the end of their sections. 
Um, so the last thing I wanted to talk about was the views and controls. Um, you can click on the participants box in your um, toolbar. Usually if, if you don't see your toolbar, if you kind of move your cursor around, it will appear. Uh, if you click on that participants uh, box, it will um, list everybody who's on the call so you can see uh, everybody who's here. Um, the other thing besides the chat box where you're going to be posting any comments or questions that you might have that we wanted to um, uh, ask everybody to use is the reactions uh, button. There are some emojis under the reactions button. We're going to be using those to have folks vote on the various motions. So um, if you can uh, click the thumbs up button um, when that happens, um, when, when um, the board members ask for um, a, a vote, uh, that will indicate your approval. So if everybody wants to click one of those emojis right now, it'll, you can just for practice, click whatever you want. There's, uh, there's a couple of uh, funny ones in there too, um, but we will be asking for the thumbs up emojis for the, for the motions themselves. Um, so I'm just going to do another quick poll right here. Um, did I, thought I stopped sharing the results. Uh, and I thought I had a second poll, but it's not showing up. So um, anyway, I will go ahead and move uh, to the agenda. Everybody should have received the agenda in the email with um, the instructions to register for the Zoom call. So um, this is, we're going to do the business uh, meeting portion of the call first, and then uh, Hillary, Mitch, and Bruce will introduce our climate resiliency plan, and um, then we'll go right from there into, um, into Dr. Brudvig's uh, presentation. So um, as I mentioned earlier, if you have any questions uh, along the way, go ahead and type them in the chat box. We'll do our best to answer them as we go, and any questions that we can't answer, staff can't answer. Um, uh, we'll gather those and Amelia will present those questions to the speaker at the end of their section. And so there will be a pause at the end of each section for questions. So don't worry about that. Uh, so with that, I will go ahead and turn the meeting over to Swinlick Board Chair Tom Coder. Thank you, Miko. Um, I assume everyone can hear me. Um, I would, on behalf of the board, like to welcome everyone as well. Um, to our meeting tonight. Thank you for joining us. Uh, more importantly, the board would like to thank you for your ongoing support and interest in our work, um, whether it's through your membership, your contributions to various projects we're involved in, your volunteer work, or most likely all three of those things. Um, we really appreciate your participation and support in, in the work that we do. Um, as Miko said, this is somewhat unconventional, obviously, uh, as far as annual meetings go, um, but we're confident that we have um, a great meeting put together with the updates that Pete will be giving us as far as uh, work that we've done this past year and work that we have um, going forward, as well as the staff presentation and our guest speaker. Um, I would uh, like to also encourage you uh, the one thing that we'd like to keep the same is our, our typical annual meeting. If at any time you feel like you need to get up and refresh your drinks, feel free to do that. Um, and, and the best thing about it being this way is no one can judge you for how many times you refresh your drinks. So, um, With that, I'd like to call the 2020 annual meeting to order. Um, and before we get to the first agenda item, I would like to take a moment to thank the staff. Um, I'm not going to single any of the staff members out. All of them um, show tremendous um, dedication commitment to what we do um, on a day-to-day -day basis and especially this past six or eight months uh, with what we've been dealing with. They've really done an outstanding job keeping um, us relevant and keeping um, people aware of our importance and what we do um, I think Pete will probably get into this a little bit, um, but I think our preserves are probably more actively used now than ever. Um, and a lot of that is um, because people are seeking places um, for both their physical and mental health during these trying times. So um, the, the staff um, deserves a lot of recognition for the work they're doing as, and of course our, our volunteers as well. So thank, thanks to them. 
Um, the first agenda item is the approval of the 2019 annual meeting minutes. Um, you should have received a copy of those as a part of the email you received. And I am going to move that we approve those minutes. Is there a second? I will, I will second that motion, Tom, this is TJ. Thank you, TJ. So it's been moved and seconded. Are there questions, comments um, regarding the minutes that you received for last year's annual meeting? If there are none, uh, we will vote. And I guess we go to where emojis, Miko, is that correct? To vote? Yep, that's correct. All in favor? I'm not sure how long we're supposed to give people to, to vote, but you give me a... Tom, this there... is all. I'm not seeing any... I can't see anything, so I'm not sure what um, whether the vote's been concluded. Or not. On the screen is where the thumbs up is showing. Well, I'm going to assume uh, we have approval. If there's anyone that's opposed, we'll give you a minute as well to vote. Tom, this is Nicole. I'm watching the screen. Uh -huh. There's no opposition. You're fine. To okay. Go. All right. Um, so it's been the minutes have been uh, approved, and so I'm going to. Um, move to the second agenda item and for the, that we turn to our, our board treasurer Tom Georgia. So Tom. Thank you Tom. Um, a bit of business that, that interests some people and some people not so much but the financial well-being of the organization is uh, you know fundamental to, to, to any operation so I'm going to take a couple minutes and do a very brief overview of the annual audit report. And this is for the Land Conservancy for the year ended March, excuse me, year ended September 30th, 2019. Um, so almost a year ago. Um, you did get in your, your email packet, there was I believe five pages, four of those uh, had the essential financial statements. So I'm going to comment on those and then move briefly to where we're at now, uh, 11 months into the current fiscal year, and, and then conclude. Um, so the audit was performed by Beagle and Melnick certified public accountants. And in their independent auditor's report, which accompanied the financial statements, uh, they say, and I quote, in our opinion, the financial statements present fairly in all material respects, the financial position of Southwest Michigan Land Conservancy Inc. as of September 30, 2019, and the results of its operations and its cash flows for the year then ended in accordance with accounting principles generally accepted in the United States of America. And that, uh, just footnote, that's the highest level of assurance uh, that an independent auditor can provide. Uh, that report has been reviewed and accepted by the Finance Committee, the Board of Directors, and the Board as well. And so we're going to ask in a minute a motion for the membership to accept it. But here's, here's a few highlights, and I'll be super brief. Statement of financial position at September 30th, 2019 shows cash and total investments at $2,845,000. That's an increase of $500,000 over the prior year end. It's a substantial uh, improvement there. The organization has no debt. Uh, net, net assets at September 30th are $27,766,000 of which 23,946,000 are preserves, preserves improvements and conservation easements. So that's the, the bulk of our assets, of course. Uh, and those net assets have increased by $848,000 over the prior year end. Uh, there's a statement of activities and changes in net assets for the year ended September 30, 2019. That shows total revenue of 
1,894,000, of which 1,551,000 are grants and contributions. So obviously that's a substantial portion of our revenue. Uh, on the expense side, the total expenses were less, <coughs> excuse me, um, were less than revenue, $1,047,000. Of that 493,000 are our program services, which is, is what it takes to run the operation, salaries, wages, uh, housing, utilities, the whole thing. The, uh, there's additional detail on all those expenses uh, included in that packet you got and it's labeled a statement of functional expenses. Um, so for the year, it had marked us, excuse me, Terrible. September 30th, 2019, revenue less expenses gives us $848,000 increase in net, net assets that we just talked about. So that it concludes a real brief summary of what happened in uh, for the year did September 30th, 2019. You're probably curious about where we're at now. So in a few days, uh, we'll be at the conclusion of our year and it's September 30th, 2020. An unusual year, as you know, with, with COVID, uh, it's been very challenging. So uh, very briefly in your report, you had a, a, a page that, that is uh, titled Unaudited Financial Summary for the 11 months in August 31st, 2020. And uh, that's that's in the packet. What I need to say about that is that our, our cash and investments continue uh, to increase. Uh, our revenues exceed our expenses. Our total assets are growing. Uh, we continue, particularly with the efforts of management at the Conservancy, we continue to monitor very closely uh, our financial position and uh, have so far have been successful in, in sort of navigating the, the, these COVID waters. Uh, and we continue to be very vigilant uh, in that area. Um, so that's, that's it on where we're at right now. Um, so let's see, what do I do now? Um, I, and, Put a motion forward for acceptance of the audited financial report for the year ended September 30th, 2019. I will second that motion, this is TJ. Right, so uh, questions or comments on that? And then do I uh, call for a vote, Tom? I guess all in favor? Wait. Yes. Okay, thank you. So I uh, call for a vote all in favor. Give the thumbs up, please. Overwhelming majority says thumbs up. You're good. Very good. I like that. Thank you. <laughs> um, so thank you. Um, so Bob Burr is up next, uh, and he will. Uh, discuss the election of uh, uh, new, well, not new, but board members to a second term. Bob. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's my pleasure to ask for the election of board members, two board members to a second term. The first board member, Jennifer Haywood, and then Tom Georgioff. And the term would be from 2020 through part of 2023. Um, if there are any questions, could you type your questions in at this point and then forward and we'll answer any questions. Any questions show up? <laughs> I, I assume none, then I would move that we approve the election of Jennifer Haywood and Tom Georgeoff to a second term. I will second that, Bob. Okay, it's been moved and supported. May we please have the vote? <laughs> oh. <laughs> you're, you're good to go, Bob. 
Looks good. Okay. Thank. Thank you. I guess it's up to me now. The floor is yours, Pete. Thank you. Well, welcome everyone. Um, thank you for uh, joining us this uh, this early evening. Uh, I'm sitting on our back deck patio, which is on East Main, and I've been muting myself. But as soon as we st I start talking, I know some motorcycles will probably come down the road. That's just how it works. Uh, I want to share some great news. Um, the big project for the last year and what I spoke to uh, at our last annual meeting was the Porter Legacy Dunes project. Um, the most recent element of that was the Carl's and Willem Foundation Challenge Grants. Uh, we completed that just after uh, Labor Day. So uh, that was the final big piece of fundraising for us. Although we continue to raise money to grow our long-term stewardship fund, which is a key component of this project. Um, right now, uh, we're working with the South Haven Area Recreation Authority, their attorney, um, and the, uh, the seller, Scott Royal and his, his realtor, uh, Gary Hardina, to uh, put all the documents together uh, that are necessary for the DNR to uh, put together what they call an escrow closing. Uh, we expect to have all those documents before the end of the month. And then there's about a 60 day turnaround time in which we can set up or the recreation authority because they are the purchaser can set up the closing. So hopefully I expect that the rec authority will purchase this property uh, in early December, just after Thanksgiving. Um, couple more items to work on with that, but I, you know, to date things have gone great. The fundraising campaign has been a great success. Thank you for everybody who's participated. Uh, the next step in this whole project is we expect in the new year around the time the spring wildflowers come out at, at uh, Porter, which is spectacular we will have some kind of an event, uh, probably hold it at Pilgrim Haven and then walk across the parking lot, a members event uh, to walk trails that will set up at Porter and begin to explore uh, trail design and constructing public access and use for the property. Uh, we will not own the property, but we have a memorandum of understanding with the recreation authority that we will oversee uh, the public use creation and protecting nature of the site, the stewardship of it. Um, so it, it's just been a fantastic project since start. Um, ultimately with Pilgrim Haven, it's going to be about 70 acres with 2000 feet of frontage on Lake Michigan. Uh, that's a pretty amazing natural area. And of course, as you look at that corridor, that uh, critical dune, forested dune corridor that runs south from Pilgrim Haven to the uh, Van Buren State Park. That's almost two miles and most of it's public or will be publicly accessible, which is I think one of the greatest gifts we can do in conservation. Um, the next thing I want to touch on is a project we're working. So what's the Encore to Porter? Well, the Encore is a project we've been calling Armand Trout. Uh, it began uh, I believe in 1995, uh, talking to the owner and Frank Ballow, uh, former board member, board president of the Conservancy, uh, submitted a proposal to the DNR Trust Fund to consider buying it. So we've been talking to the Armand Trout family uh, for 25 years about this property. It's 140 acres. It has three miles of frontage on the Kalamazoo River with steep bluffs, about a third of the property is riparian wetlands along the river and it's just up river just above the city of Allegan on the property you can see downtown Allegan. Um, we're currently negotiating a price with the landowners there's the Armand Trout and Milbacher families that co-own it. Uh, we've begun community outreach and engagement talking to the city 
uh, the community foundation, some other conservation groups about this project. And we're uh, staff, we're all working together to kind of develop a fundraising campaign that I expect will, will begin this fall, but really uh, turn up the, uh, the, the heat in the spring with hopefully the expectation that we will be able to purchase this property in 2021. So that's the next big thing to look forward to. Um, the uh, 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 Hillary, Mitch, and Bruce will talk to in a few minutes the uh, climate resiliency plan, which is our strategic plan. Uh, a little more than a decade ago, we developed the first one. Uh, about a year and a half ago, we started the 2.0 version of a conservation plan, which takes into account uh, the impacts of climate change and how that's going to uh, change the landscapes and how we might want to address not just conserving land, but how we steward it. Um, this is going to be our guidance document uh, for the next decade foreseeable future on focusing where to protect land that has the greatest impact. And um, you're going to learn a little bit more about that. But no, it is, it's, we call it the Climate Resiliency Plan, or we called it, we're starting to call it Nature's Network. It is basically a strategic conservation plan. And then the last thing I just want to say is, we had all kinds of plans and activities and all kinds of things we wanted to do, just like every other nonprofit, every other organization, and then COVID hit. And I uh, spoke to this in the most recent newsletter which uh, I will let everybody know, Amelia Hansen uh, did a great job of making me sound uh, a lot better than I am. And I thank her for that. But uh, whether it's been the staff's response, uh, the board's commitment, um, we've actually on some level kind of flourished over the last six months, especially with our stewardship and, and uh, land protection efforts. Um, the challenges of raising money to do our work going forward, I, it, it's unclear, it's there, but I will tell you that uh, nature is essential, nature is a solution. Um, one of the moments that's most memorable for me from the last six months was I went out to the Portman Nature Preserve and sat in the parking lot for about an hour and a half and wrote emails on a Saturday and then a Sunday um, in late April, early May. And I watched the cars come and go and the families visit. Um, it was remarkable. And uh, I projected based on what I saw, probably a thousand people visited the Portman Nature Preserve over that weekend. Um, so we have impact, we have value. Uh, People are, if there's one benefit, people are rediscovering nature in the outdoors, and that's what we offer. Um, so thank you all for supporting us, and thank you for being members. And with that, I turn it to Tom Coder. Thanks, Pete. Um, congratulations to you and the staff for another great year. It's, uh, the Porter Project's obviously really very exciting, and Armand Trout is as well, and all the other smaller things that we're involved in, so... Thank you for that. Um, before we conclude the business portion of tonight's uh, mm -hmm. gathering, does anybody have any questions related to the business portion of the meeting or, or get together tonight? Mm -hmm. uh, if Nicole or Miko, are you seeing that there are any questions? Is anybody typing them in? I'm not seeing anything yet, Tom. Okay, all right. Um, assuming there are none, then I will move that we conclude uh, the 2020 mm -hmm. annual meeting. I'll make a motion and hope that uh, next year we'll all be back together again in some uh, outdoor setting. Uh, would someone like to second the motion to conclude tonight's meeting? I will second that, Tom. Please Thank you, TJ. Good. Just moved and seconded. All in favor? 
I see and, plenty of thumbs up, Tom. I all right. Any know. any opposition to concluding the meeting? I don't see any thumbs down. All right. Well, I assume none. And I will be happy to turn this meeting over to uh, Mitch, Hillary, and Bruce. Um, thank you for doing this for us tonight. We look forward to your presentation. Thanks for that intro, Tom. Much appreciated. So uh, thank you all again so much for being here virtually. We are very excited to unveil our new strategic land conservation plan for you this evening. So here are the three of us uh, who will be presenting that. My name is Hillary Hunt. I'm one of the land protection staff members at the Conservancy and one of three staff leads on this project. Bruce Howe, also from Land Protection, and Mitch Leto, Stewardship Director, will also be speaking during portions of this presentation. And Miko, I'm going to screen share if that's all right. Great. So as we present today on our new strategic land conservation plan, please feel free to type your questions in the chat box and we will answer all the questions at the end of the meeting since Lars presentation, which is directly after ours, may actually answer a lot of those questions. Um, we should probably preface this by saying that this plan, it should probably be called the plan of many names. You've probably heard it by three just this evening alone, um, but we call it nature's network which is our strategic land conservation plan, but it's also a plan based on climate resilience, which is a concept you'll be hearing a little bit later. So once you hear a little bit more, I think all three of those concepts will mean a bit more to you. So our new strategic plan is based on some of the most recent discoveries and concepts in the fields of ecology and conservation biology, namely landscape connectivity and climate resilience. This plan has been the result of a year and a half of meetings and input from experts evaluating our service area via spatial modeling software and making decisions about our conservation priorities based on the results of the models we built. While you saw an overview of the plan in our 2020 summer newsletter, today we'll be sharing maps of the new focal areas um, for our conservation work moving forward over the next decade. You should also have received an email from Miko, uh, I think Monday, uh, which had maps of these new priority areas. So, but first, just a few words here about how we selected these priority areas. So, uh, like I said, in early 2019, Swimlick staff identified our three priority criteria for land protection projects. They're here before you on this slide. They are biodiversity, connectivity, and water quality. This means that our goal is to protect places where these three criteria are outstanding biodiverse places that have existing rich biodiversity and diverse landforms and soil types that will promote future biodiversity. We also want to protect highly connected places that are linked on the landscape to other conserved or natural land. Places where wildlife can move across the landscape without too many physical barriers such as structures and roads and cities. We also protect places with excellent water quality where water resources can be shielded from pollution and development. Protecting biodiversity and water quality have always been priorities, as you all know, but connectivity is a newer consideration, both in ecology and at Swimlick. You'll learn much more about habitat connectivity a bit later in the call when we hear from Lars Bredvig, our keynote speaker. Of course, protecting nature for nature's sake is not our only goal. It is also our goal to make sure that every resident of Southwest Michigan has access to beautiful outdoor spaces. When the land is not too sensitive for groups of visitors, we really believe in equitable public access to these places so that everyone is able to benefit from the priceless values and well being we all reap from spending time in the natural world. Now we'll talk a little bit about the mapping and modeling process that we went through. Uh, using geographic information system software, Swimlick staff worked with the WMU Upjohn Center for Geographical Change to build a spatial model that incorporated these three criteria, as well as many other landscape features, which together helped to reveal the most ecologically important places to work in our service area. The greatest threat to healthy ecosystems in a region is the rapidly changing climate. So we frame this entire analysis within the context of protecting areas that are most resilient to climate change. You may be able to instinctively think of some climate resilient places, 
So areas of land with diverse topography, places with a healthy variety of native species in their natural communities, and places with slightly different temperatures and humidity when you walk from the top of a ridge down to the bottom. Resilient places often occur where water gathers in the dry season and gives wildlife a break, or where high quality sites are connected to other natural land and are completely isolated from all other, all other green space. These areas, resilient sites, are the places that can survive the system-wide changes we're seeing today through climate change and extinction. These resilient sites must also incorporate the three criteria outlined previously, which make an area of land worth our time and effort. They are the places that will be most stable in the face of change, and they are the places that give us hope. Southwest Michigan is expected to experience some pretty drastic changes over the next few decades. So our goal with incorporating climate resilience into our priorities is to invest in the places which will remain high quality over the years. We want to use our resources and your donations wisely and make sure that we have an impact that lasts. So here are the steps we follow to build our mapping model. First, we divided the entire nine county service area region into hexagon shapes on the map with each hexagon measuring a quarter mile across. Then we analyzed each hexagon to give them each a score and then ranked them based on the three criteria of biodiversity, connectivity, and water quality. From there, we zoomed back out to the entire region to look at the trends across the landscape and where the high scoring hex hexagons gathered. So here's what we got from our first round of mapping that Bruce spoke about. The individual spots of color on this map are the quarter mile hexagons that he mentioned. The highest scoring hexagons are blue, followed by green, then yellow, orange, and red. Red and orange and yellow areas tend to correspond to things like cities and urbanized areas and some kinds of intensive agriculture. Blue areas and green areas are often state game areas, nature preserves, river corridors, or known populations of rare species. Also sparsely populated rural areas with natural cover of vegetation. From that map, we distilled down into 15 priority areas on the landscape, seven biodiversity hubs, and eight conservation corridors. These biodiversity hubs are centers of biodiversity, places that are large and managed for biodiversity and game species. They include many of our state game areas, Fort Custer Recreation Area and Training Center, for example, or places where lots of conservation groups, such as the Southwest Michigan Land Conservancy, have been working on conservation for a long time, and there's a concentration of protected land there. The corridors are the paths of least resistance through this landscape. In general, corridors connect one biodiversity hub to another or allow species movement from south to north to escape changing temperatures, climate impacts, and allow for annual migrations. They're not necessarily as high quality as the biodiversity hubs in terms of habitat, but they do offer avenues for movement or migration to more suitable locations. So now here's the final map that represents over a year of analysis, mapping, and planning. We're really excited to show it to you here tonight. The map shows all seven hubs, which are in hot pink. From the south, working clockwise, our biodiversity hubs are the Jones Hub, the Pawpaw Hub, the Allegan Hub, the Berry Hub, Middleville Hub, Big Marsh Hub, and finally the Fort Custer Hub. Then our conservation corridors, also starting from the south and moving clockwise, are the Conservation Gateway in purple, which connects the Indiana State Line to the Jones Hub, the Glacial Lakes Corridor in orange, which connects Jones to Pawpaw, then the Black River Corridor, which connects Pawpaw to Allegan, Kalamazoo Moraine in yellow, which connects Pawpaw to Barry, the Thorn Apple, which connects Barry to Middleville, then what we're calling Cal Bear in green, which connects Barry to Big Marsh, going from Barry County to Calhoun County. Augusta Creek is in red and connects Barry Hub to Fort Custer Hub. Finally, the largest of them all is the Lakeshore Corridor, which does not have a formal start or end point, but includes thousands of acres of protected land along the shore of Lake Michigan. 
In the attachments that Miko has shared with you, you should have a copy of the previous overall map, as well as a map of each individual hub and corridor. Unfortunately, we don't have time to go through each one of them tonight, but we'll give you an example of how to interpret them here, looking at the Pawpaw Hub. So you can see on this map that there's this pink outline around the entire hub. And remember, this hub is a biodiversity hub, so it's representing the highest quality places on our landscape. So within the pink outline, the shaded areas are where the hub is connected to corridors, down here with orange and up here with yellow. And within the hub, the protected land is marked with cross hatching. Orange is a swimlet conservation easement. Purple cross hatching designates other types of protected land. And then green cross hatching is a swimlet preserve. For example, you can see Portman Nature Preserve in the center of your screen in green. The final map to share with you today is a map of the Augusta Creek Corridor, which connects Fort Custer Hub with Berry Hub. So again, you can see the cross hatching to designate protected land. And as a reminder, a corridor it serves as a connection between hubs and is not necessarily managed for biodiversity in itself. To conclude, we are very proud to share this work and these maps with you. The 15 hubs and corridors will be the primary focal areas for our work moving forward over the next decade. But that doesn't mean that we will ignore high quality areas outside of these hubs and corridors. After all, many of our preserves and conservation easements are located outside of them, uh, but these are the places that our mapping has identified. Overall though, I think the lens of hubs and corridors and climate resilient areas gives us a science-based direction with which to move forward in our conservation work. So now we will introduce Lars Rudvig, who's our keynote speaker. Nico. <laughs> This Lars Brudvig is our keynote speaker for this evening. He hails from Michigan State University, where he is Associate Professor of Plant Biology and founder of the Brudvig Lab. Everybody wave into your camera to welcome Lars this evening. Thanks so much for coming, Lars. Oh, Lars. All right, I think I'm unmuted now. Is that true? Yep, you're good now. I think I need to have the ability to share my screen though. Okay. Sorry, we should have worked this out before. <laughs> you should be able to share now, Lars. Hmm. Not getting it. Lars, I'm just going to make you a co-host. So that's okay. up in a second. Can you do it now? Yes. All right. Have at it. How does that look, everybody? Looks good, Lars. Go ahead. OK. Thanks. Let me know if the sound is off too, okay? But thank you all for uh, having me. Um, it's wonderful to talk to you about something that I'm passionate about, and it's um, you know wonderful to, to see that you're passionate about it as well, and that's reconnecting our landscapes for biodiversity. Um, There we go. All right, so I want to do a few things today. First of all, um, talk about what corridors are, why they're needed. I know we've gotten some of this introduction already. Which, um, and then maybe this sounds a little bit backwards, but um, I'll then talk about, uh, address the question of do corridors work? Think about some of the challenges with corridors and how they fit into a broader set of landscape connectivity tools that we have in conservation. Um, and then round out by connecting back in um, with your plans for connect, promoting connectivity in southwestern Michigan. All right, so here's the problem. This is a sort of aerial photograph that I imagine that you are all very familiar with. 
Um, and this presents the big problem that I know that you work with every day at SwimLAC, and that's that um, humans have destroyed and fragmented a lot of habitat across many different landscapes. The one we're looking at here is from Lansing and just south of Lansing. This is an area that historically was um, covered by mesic forest, beech maple forest, and we can see that there are just patches of that remaining. So much of this forest has been destroyed for agriculture, um, for creation of the city and outlying towns. Uh, and this destruction and fragmentation of habitat is pretty widely viewed um, by ecologists and conservation biologists as the greatest threat to biodiversity in our world. Um, so fragmentation, what is fragmentation? We can see this process play out over time um, in this set of maps from uh, Cadiz Township in Wisconsin. We can see that historically, this was a landscape covered by green and this is forest cover. And then progressively following European settlement, the forest has been both destroyed and the parcels that, that are left are broken up. So this is this process of fragmentation, this breaking up and isolation of fragments um, that accompanies habitat destruction, habitat loss. Um, and so this poses a problem for plants and animals. Habitat destruction certainly poses a problem. There's less habitat to go around. But when we have fragmented landscapes, this also means that plants and animals are going to have challenges moving between the fragments. And that can mean difficulty finding mates. That can mean over time erosions, losses of genetic diversity. Um, and to, um, this can lead to then greater rates of local extinction. So in other words, species winking out of patches, fragments of habitat, and when they do, they're less likely to recolonize into those fragments because it's hard to get around these landscapes. And this is where corridors can come in. So what are corridors? Corridors are uh, traditionally thought of as strips of habitat that would connect up otherwise isolated fragments of habitat. So we can think about these sort of as super highways for plants and animals um, to get around fragmented landscapes. Now, these are thought to then increase movement between otherwise isolated fragments of habitat. Um, this can then, for the reasons I was describing on the last slide, reduce these localized extinctions, these winking out of species within fragments. This can bolster genetic diversity because individuals are moving around more, mating with, um, you know, over generations, a greater uh, diversity of individuals. Um, and in some, increase species diversity. So what we expect then is that fragments that are connected by corridors and landscapes that have corridors connecting fragments within them should have more species of plants and animals living within them compared to fragmented landscapes that lack corridors. And this makes a ton of intuitive sense. We build the highways, um, the plants and animals can move around, and indeed um, connecting fragmented landscapes and building corridors into connectivity plans has been incredibly um, widespread and popular. And we have lots and lots of examples that we can draw on, um, including the, the missing linkages project in California, you can see in the upper left of this slide, all the way up to these huge large scale um, regional connectivity plans, like in the upper right, the Yellowstone to Yukon corridor, which um, is working to reconnect migration routes between for, for large mammals between Yellowstone National Park um, and the Yukon territories. And it's been to the point where in textbooks, we now have statements like clearly the ideas of reconnecting our landscapes has taken hold. So it's been very intuitive, very popular. So the question is, do corridors work? And to address this question, we need to think about the differences between landscape connectivity and corridors. Um, and so landscape connectivity is the way that a landscape may facilitate movement. Now, corridors may be a tool to, to promote landscape connectivity, but in order to do that, the corridors themselves need to, to increase rates of movement between fragments of habitat. Um, and um, that in turn is required for corridors to increase biodiversity. So this leads to several questions. You know, do corridors actually do the job that we hope that they're doing? Do they increase rates of movement across landscapes? Do they increase connectivity? And in turn, if they do, do we actually see this benefit to biodiversity when we put this investment in place of, of building corridors or conserving them? So this is where some of my research has come in. I've been involved with what's called the Savannah River Site or SRS Corridor Project. Um, this is a large experiment that takes place within the range of longleaf pine ecosystems in the southeastern United States. 
at a, kind of a quirky location that I don't have time to get into today, but the Department of Energy Savannah River site, which is a large 80,000 hectare um, DOE base, um, primarily forested land in South Carolina, um, again, within this historic range of longleaf pine. Um, and what the corridor experiment then has done is created a set of fragments by clearing dense pine plantations and restoring those openings for the historic longleaf pine savanna. And this is an ecosystem um, that we might think of as being analogous in a lot of ways to oak savannas. Sparse canopy, fire maintained, tremendous diversity of understory plants and a variety of animals depending on these savanna conditions. So we've been working now for 20 years to restore these openings to longleaf pine savanna. And this is a huge experiment. So we're showing one of the eight replicate fragmented landscapes in the upper right of this slide, each of the fragments, those clearings, is about twice the size of a football field. So this is a huge experiment, and that's important because it provides realism. Now, corridors, you know, in conservation are large endeavors, and so we wanted to create a large experiment to be able to mimic those conditions and test then the effect of connecting fragments with corridors by comparing those connected fragments to, as you can see in this picture, fragments that lack a connection and are isolated between each other. This experiment was created in 2000, the year 2000, um, before that growing season, and it's been running now for almost 21 years. And we've been able to ask, in what ways does connecting fragments matter for the plants and animal populations and, and communities that um, you know, in, inhabit these fragments? So one question then coming back to these questions that are important to address is do corridors promote dispersal and researchers in our group over the years have studied this um, for a variety of different taxa broadly by marking individual animals and plants and then asking where do they move. So if we mark one of these animals um, and it moves to a different fragment, uh, will it move more likely if that fragment is connected by a corridor than if that's an isolated fragment. Again, this is what we hope will happen if corridors are doing their jobs. And so we can look at a graph then summarizing some of these results. Um, what this is showing is the percentage increase in movement between um, patches comparing connected to unconnected fragments. So the way to interpret this then is if the bars go above zero, um, then the rates of movement are greater between corridor connected patches. Connect corridors are increasing movement. Um, and if the bar goes below zero, then movement would for some reason be impeded by corridors. And what we can see is for a variety of different taxa, including plants with their pollen, plants with their seeds, small mammals, and a bunch of different insect species, um, they indeed move more frequently between fragments when we reconnect them with a corridor. Um, so this is what we expect. Um, the magnitude of this effect varies, but in some cases is really, really large, you know, hundreds of, of percent greater rates of movement between fragments when we connect them with corridors. So does that lead to this expected increase in biodiversity? Uh, to study this, um, our group led by Ellen Damshin at the University of Wisconsin and myself have been surveying these fragments every single year now for 21 years for the plant species living in them. We go down in the middle of July in the blazing South Carolina sun um, and gluttons for punishment. We walk back and forth across these fragments and write down every species of plant living in every single one of them every summer for 21 years now. And using these data then we can ask, are corridors increasing the diversity of plant species? And in a nutshell, the answer is yes. Um, this graph is um, from a paper we just very recently published summarizing the first 18 years of data. Um, and what this shows then is that over time, since the experiment was created, corridors have been progressively promoting more and more species of plants um, in those fragments that they connect. And the effect is large. We're seeing about 20 um, more species of plants living in corridor connected fragments compared to the isolated fragments. And what's really striking about this is that you can see the line is going up, up and up and up. And what that means is that each year, um, we're seeing more accumulation of plant species in the corridor connected fragments. Um, we don't know when, when this pattern will level out. At some point it has to level out. We don't have infinite plant species living even in this very biodiverse longleaf pine savanna landscape. Um, but this shows really big dividends paid by reconnecting our landscapes, but it takes time for this to play out. This is not an overnight sort of effect, um, but takes decades 
potentially many decades, we don't know the answer yet, um, to see its, its full impact. Okay, so what are some of the challenges with corridors? So first of all, corridors being these long, narrow, typically connections on landscapes can create a lot of edge. Um, and we know that some, um, some uh, plants and animals that we might not want to promote in conservation may be edge specialists, including invasive species. So this is something that we need to keep an eye on when we create corridors and the edges that they contain. Um, corridors are thought to maybe promote undesirable species or processes. Um, there are concerns among ecologists that corridors may promote invasions. So facilitate the movement of invasive species, sweeping across landscapes, the spread of diseases, or maybe spread disturbances, which you know, we can imagine might be positive or negative depending on the context. What we know from our experiment is that corridors um, do not incre increase the diversity of invasive species. And in fact, it's the native longleaf pine savanna species that are driving this biodiversity effect of corridor connectivity. We see over time, this is early in the time series, but we're seeing the same effect to this day, that corridors increase the number of longleaf pine savanna species. These are species that are native to longleaf pine savannas, um, whereas corridors are not increasing exotic species like the species Ceresia lespedisa. And one reason we think that this might be the case is that invasive species are just really good at getting around. They've gotten from some other place in the world already. They're good at moving. They often um, have fruits that are spread by birds or other means, and they just simply don't maybe need corridors to move around landscapes, unlike native species. So finally, we have this, this challenge of scaling up. So I've talked about some of our experimental results. This is a large experiment, but compared to some of these large, um, scale conservation efforts like the one that you're embarking in, um, it's, it's small. And so how do we scale up um, our understanding and our implementation of corridors to these regional scales? And this is a big deal. So um, you're not the only ones doing this. I'm happy to say there are a number of big scale conservation efforts. I mentioned the Y to Y corridor before. We have um, the Florida Wildlife Corridor focused on panthers in Florida and a number of others around the world. Um, and so different groups are, are grappling with this challenge of how to reconnect big heterogeneous landscapes, um, which present challenges. So for example, we may want to increase connectivity between these two patches of, or areas of forest. Um, and in this case, right in the middle of them is the Sonoma Valley in California, where let, let's face it, we're not going to have the ability to just uh, go through wine country and, and build a corridor. Um, and so this requires the use of additional conservation techniques. So the question is, what sort of tools do we have at our disposal to promote landscape connectivity? So for example, get this turtle to move between one patch of forest and another. So I've talked about corridors, these contiguous strips of habitat. These may help turtles, in this case, move from one patch of habitat to another. We also have tools um, called stepping stones. So we can think of these as kind of mini patches of habitat um, that individuals can kind of jump between. So they, they might be kind of a discontiguous corridor or little bits and pieces of habitat um, between two otherwise larger reserve areas. We can also think about ways to make the matrix, we call it, more friendly. These areas of inhospitable um, land cover that may be between our focal um, reserve areas, like this cornfield, that may be an impediment to, in this case, this turtle's movement because it doesn't want to walk through a cornfield. So we might be able, to, we may not have the capacity to reforest, in this case, this entire cornfield, but maybe we can make it a little bit more friendly, um, just using an example of the conservation reserve program here. So maybe that would help this turtle get across, even though maybe that's not, um, this prairie sort of habitat is not the turtle's prime habitat, it may be, um, the sort of habitat that it could move through, getting between one patch of forest and another. And we can also think about promoting natural processes um, and natural ecosystem structure. And I think that this could be a big deal in Southwest Michigan, where we have a historical open savanna, barrens, grasslands sort of landscape, which because of fire suppression has um, seen a lot of canopy closure. So by the use of things like prescribed fire, clearing activities, maybe we can reopen some of these landscapes and then thereby facilitate movement of organisms that require some of these open conditions to move around a landscape.
So these have all been what we might call sort of natural solutions to promote landscape connectivity. We might need engineering solutions in other cases, things like building overpasses and underpasses over highways, even two lane paved roads can be major impediments for, um, for animals, including even large animals moving across landscapes. So coming back again now to your plan, um, I'm so excited about this. This is so exciting to see a map like this for southwestern Michigan, um, seeing some of these core reserve areas and then plans for promoting connectivity between them. And I guess um, my thought here is um, there's a lot of tools at your disposal um, and it's going to be really exciting to watch how you think about how to best use those to increase landscape connectivity at this big regional scale. So to summarize then, before we take some questions, if people have them, Corridors can benefit biodiversity by promoting movement. We see that um, within our, our fragmentation and corridors experiment at the Savannah River site, and also from a lot of other scientific evidence that comes from around the world in a variety of different ecosystems with a variety of different taxa. Now again, corridors are one way of promoting connectivity. And I think that this is, this is the goal here is to promote landscape connectivity because we know that this benefits biodiversity. Corridors are one tool, there are other tools as well. Um, and with that, that presents many opportunities that can get tailored to particular cases, particular instances. So with that, um, I want to point you to this website. This is a website that um, my research group is involved with, conservationcorridor.org, which has lots more information. The goal of this website is to connect conservation research with conservation practice as it relates to landscape connectivity and corridors. Um, and I'll say thanks and take any questions that you might have. Lars, can you hear me? I can, yeah. Okay. Um, there are a couple of questions here. Um, Janet asks, um, how can we as a group help with this? So I think supporting groups like Swimlock is, is a fantastic way to help with this. Um, and the reason is, is because you have awesome conservation professionals that have done the hard work to create an, an amazing plan here. So I think by supporting groups like Swimlek, then they can, that can facilitate them putting those plans into place. Um, also, Will is asking, do you have data yet on stepping stones as useful corridors? There are data on stepping stones. Admittedly, those have been less researched than corridors. I think that that's an area where we as researchers need to do more work. Um, there are no experimental studies uh, like the one that we've conducted in South Carolina for stepping stones, but there are smaller experiments that have been performed, for example, um, with little, little bits of grassland and things like insects moving between them. So there's, there's work to do to, to bring those up to scale, I think, but at least the results that we have so far show that stepping stones can work in similar ways to corridors. Um, we've got another one. Um, are electric right-of-ways large enough to be corridors? Sure, that's a great question. So I think that relates to another question that I'm often asked and that's how wide should we build our corridors? We can see the, in this picture, the width of the corridor, um, it's exactly 18 researchers wide, um, also known as 25, uh, 25 meters wide. Um, and so this is the scale of our experiment. Our corridors are 25 meters wide and 150 meters long. Um, there's no magical answer to how wide a corridor should be. Um, one thing that I would point out though is the longer a corridor is, the more important it becomes that it is wide. And the reason for that is that the longer corridors are likely going to require multiple bouts of movement and potentially even multiple generations of movement for, for things like insects and plants for um, a population to spread all the way down them. And so what that means then is the corridor becomes more and more important to serve as not just a conduit of movement, but habitat itself as they become longer and longer. Um, and in general, the wider the corridor is, the less influenced by its edges it'll be and the higher quality of the habitat it will be. So coming back around to the question, um, uh, utility right-of-ways can absolutely function as corridors. 
I think that the key to thinking about this though is what would you intend for them to connect and do they support similar or similar enough sort of land cover that animals that are looking to move between the, the various fragments of habitat might use what's growing um, in the utility right of way um, as a movement pathway. There's uh, two questions that are kind of related. Um, Nancy was asking, how can roads and highways be worked around to allow corridors? And then Tom asked, what are some ways to broach a linear barrier like I-94? Yeah, yeah. And so, like I, I mentioned this very briefly, but um, roads can be really major impediments. One example to point out is that um, it, we actually have evidence that two-lane paved roads um, can sever movement of, for grizzly bears um, in the Northwest. And so, you know, we don't have grizzly bears around here, but I use that example because in my mind, at least, grizzly bears can get anywhere, right? And what, what's a road to a grizzly bear? But it actually will impede their movement across a landscape. So we can then imagine what roads are doing for smaller, maybe less mobile types of, of taxa and, and, and organisms. So how can we facilitate animal movement with roads? I think two of the big tools that we have are, are overpasses and underpasses. So overpasses are kind of like bridges that will go over a road and will typically have some sort of natural land cover on them. Almost, you can imagine, envision almost like a green roof built into a road and going over um, you know, another paved road, like, like an interstate highway even. And that can work kind of like a natural green bridge for animals. There can be similar sorts of structures that are at, un, called underpasses, and those are actually tunnels, um, which again, hopefully have some sort of like natural type, naturalness to them. It becomes a little bit more complicated in a tunnel, of course, because we don't have light getting down very well into it. But it can still be a way for animals to get safely across a road, um, especially a busy road. Did I get both of those questions, Amelia? I think so. Nancy and Tom, do you guys agree? Do you feel like your questions have been answered? I guess we'll, I think so, Lars. Okay, excellent. Oh, here we go. Nancy asked, um, underpasses and overpasses or tunnels are costly. Are communities receiving any benefit monetarily to do this? Yeah, so who pays for all this? Um, that's a really good question. Um, you know, the, I think that um, typically it's been through initiatives like your initiative. Um, I say like your initiative, like SwimLEC, because it's been, um, you know, initiatives where people have been able to get behind and, and generate money through, you know, donors, through various grants to be able to support these efforts. Um, one example I would point to would be um, an overpass that's being built across the highway that runs um, through the mountains in, in Los Angeles. Um, that's, I'm trying to remember the number of lanes. I want to say it's a 16 lane highway or something like that. It's a massive, massive highway and, take, and it's taking a massive overpass. It's a very costly endeavor, but there's been tremendous public support for facilitating um, the building of this overpass, which is geared largely at mountain lions, but, but could also benefit a variety of other animal species there. People have a lot of questions, which is great. Oh, good. <laughs> Sarah was asking, um, have you thought about doing any experiments closer to Michigan? Yeah, I, I have. Um, and I've actually done some work on you know, surveying some of the Swimlek properties, in fact. Um, in Michigan, I work in oak savannas and in prairies, and we haven't done connectivity related work so much here, but, but the focus has been on restoring those ecosystems, restoring prairies that have been um, created from agricultural fields or are fire suppressed and are being restored, and similarly for oak savannas um, working from fire suppressed states. So I do lots of work in Michigan. I didn't mention any of it today. Uh, it's similar, but also a little bit different from from the corridor work. Um, we've got two questions that kind of go together. Um, Donna was asking, what are the 
Well, actually, this one might be one more for Hillary and Mitch and Bruce. So maybe Donna, we can hold off until those guys come back. Um, but uh, Carol was asking, is the proposal designed to, is our proposal designed to expand the habitat of endangered species specifically? And I guess actually, I'm sorry, that's probably one more for uh, Mitch and Hillary and Bruce as well. Um, Pete asked, uh, do you know if insurance companies ever pay for these overpasses? Not that I've ever heard of. I would love to see that, but <laughs> I've never heard of it before. It's a good question. Um, yeah, vehicle collisions, particularly with deer, are a huge deal. Um, and if that was a tool to help reduce those, that would be fantastic. Mitch, do you want to take some of the um, questions that are more specific to Swim Lake? Sure. So if everyone can hear me, I spied a couple of questions early on that were uh, kind of specific to our climate resiliency plan, AKA Nature's Network. And one of them uh, came from Steve Diller, I think it was. So um, thanks for the good question. Said, you know, why does the Lakeshore Corridor have no hub at either end of it? Our effort was really to try to make sure these places were connected. Um, and he kind of pointed out that we don't want a road to nowhere. And I would completely agree. And I think the, the reason for that one, that's our only corridor that's not connected to a large biodiversity hub, is because those are also the edges of our service area. So the nine, eight and a half counties that we work in end about halfway up Allegan County and at the state line of Indiana. Um, it's not actually where the world ends, although it seems that way to us sometimes, but we're actually through this process of resiliency planning, we've been connecting with a lot of the land trusts and conservation groups outside of our service area and has really pushed us to work together more. And so we've been talking with our counterparts over the state line um, in that Lakeshore corridor, the Shirley Hines Land Trust in Northwest Indiana. And um, as you might suspect, the Lakeshore is also a high priority for them. So if we continue to protect land along the lakeshore, we can kind of know that in doing that, um, we'll be well served at the southern end of our service area. And at the northern end of our service area, the Land Conservancy of West Michigan we've been connecting with, and they've also recently conducted a similar analysis. Um, the lakeshore is also a priority of theirs. And um, Steve also asked about the Allegan State Game Area. Um, the top half of that is out of our service area as well. Uh, but actually the Kalamazoo River runs through the Allegan State Game Area. And if you follow that natural river corridor to Saugatuck, it actually ends in that Lakeshore Corridor. Um, so that could be an avenue for those species to move. And then Jay and Julie um, asked about what some of the specific climate change impacts would be in our area. And Lars, feel free to jump in if anything stands out to you in terms of biodiversity or landscapes, but there are Definitely too many to go over all right now, but a couple of them that stand out to me are ice cover, high summertime temperatures, and overall precipitation. So we're forecasted um, in the Midwest, and these, these effects are documented by formal research institutions and agencies like NOAA and universities, but we're also seeing them from everyone from you know, farmers to everyday folks like us. Um, are that we're getting more precipitation overall in Michigan, um, but the precipitation patterns aren't spread out over a nice um, sort of gentle linear way um, from, from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. We're tending to get uh, what we call bookended, so we're getting a lot of rain um, in the spring and the fall and not as much in the summer. It's kind of the general pattern. And many of those rain events are sort of shorter and more intense pulses. And so this can have an effect on things like erosion um, along our river courses and in farmland. Um, also affects things like farmland uh, abandonment and those kind of patterns sort of have effects down the line uh, that we can't talk all about tonight. Um, and the high summertime temperatures are um, going to stress plants and animals that are adapted to cooler landscapes. So as Bruce mentioned, earlier in the presentation, if we have landscapes that span low cool areas and, and uh, ridge tops and things like that with topographic diversity, those species can hopefully move within an area to find the, the temperature that they prefer. 
And then the other thing that we're thinking about through these corridors and through our stewardship projects is uh, how can we facilitate migration of things like tree species that can't move uh, as well as something like a bat or a bird. And so we're looking at those species that are at the southern end of our service area and thinking about incorporating that into restoration projects at the northern end. Um, we're also seeing increased carbon dioxide and of course that's having uh, effects on certain plant species that that eat carbon dioxide and like it. Um, I know certain invasive species um, like it as well as some natives. So I don't know if anything stands out to you there, Lars, that. That's really great, Mitch. And I guess one other thing I'd point out from our experiment in, in South Carolina is that we've had some surprises over the years and they've always been positive surprises. Um, and I think that the take home message is that um, it, uh, Reconnecting landscapes is, is really important for uh, reinstating or instating, you know, these important movement processes and sometimes sometimes in ways that we wouldn't anticipate or over time frames we wouldn't anticipate. Um, and so, you know, by putting connections back in place, um, it can have benefits that we may not even foresee going in at the beginning. All right, thank you so much, uh, Lars, for your presentation and Mitch and Hillary and Bruce. It's so cool to see how our work is tying together with uh, your research and seems like we're doing the right thing. So thank you so much for your uh, presentation. We really appreciate it. Um, can everybody see my screen now on uh, the PowerPoint with the questions slide? Okay. Um, yeah. We are uh, we are about 15 minutes over time, and so um, I think if anybody had any questions that didn't get answered, uh, we tried to gather those and, and forward them to the appropriate people and get back to you with a response on that. Um, uh, and if anybody has any other questions that um, they didn't pose but you know come up later, feel free to email them to conserveland at swimlick.org. And uh, we'll try to get them to Lars if they're for Lars or Bruce, Hillary, and Mitch, or if you have any questions for any of the rest of us, uh, likewise, we'll, we'll try to get back to you with answers on those. Um, but uh, we just wanted to thank you all so much for being here tonight and for bearing with us as we kind of navigated this new format. Um, it's been a challenge, but uh, along with challenges come lots of opportunities. So. We're uh, excited that we were able to connect with you this way um, tonight. And um, just want to thank everybody who's been here. Thank all of you, our members. Uh, none of this work would be possible without all of you guys. Um, uh, and your support is making a huge difference for land conservation stewardship um, in Southwest Michigan and helping to connect more people with nature every day. So. We really appreciate it. Um, again, we've uh, been recording this call, so it will be posted um, to our website later and to our YouTube channel as well. So keep an eye out for email uh, announcements about that. Uh, again, let us know if you have any questions. Thank you all so much for being here and uh, we hope to be able to see you all in person sometime soon. I just so wanna quickly state, thank you for joining us. Thank you all who put this together um, and thank all of you for your support and involvement as volunteers, as donors, as members, and enjoying the places we protect. Um, thank you. Have a great night. <laughs>